I will be talking about uh, how we could modulate associative memory formation by multi-sensory uh, phase synchronization. And I uh, do not have any uh, conflict of interest to declare. So we can jump right in. Um, just go to the next slide. So in my lab, we are very interested in episodic memory. Uh, and how our brain allows us to form these, these memories. So episodic memory, just to remind you, are those types of memories that you form on a, a single occasion. So when you go to a restaurant, you have some food there, you meet some people there, then um, you are able to form these very associative, very rich memories, although you've only experienced them once. And uh, what, what we are scratching our head about is what are the neural mechanisms that, that allow us to form these memories in such an efficient and information rich manner. And of course, an answer to this question uh, has been formulated a long time ago, namely that neural synchronization is what is uh, allowing us to form these memories. Uh, it's coined by the very famous uh, a phrase neurons that fire together wire together by Donald Tapp. So that's what every psychology student, neuroscientist student learns in their first uh, semester. Um, and we've learned a lot from animal models about the intricate mechanisms that allow synaptic plasticity uh, to occur. Uh, but what we know astonishingly little of is how, and, and, uh, and whether these mechanisms are actually a play in the human brain whilst we, we form memories. And um, I hope I can shed some light uh, into this in these next few slides. So uh, from animal models, we've learned that there are at least two very uh, um, prominent candidates for synaptic plasticity. One is theta phase dependent plasticity. And here I'm showing a slide by the, from the famous paper by Huerta and Lisman, where they've shown that, oops, if um, a burst is given at the trough of a theta wave, then you get long-term depression. And if it's given at the peak of the theta wave, then you get long-term uh, potentiation. Uh, let me point out here that what is a trough in the peak very much depends on where the theta is recorded in the hippocampus, so that might switch. But what this uh, uh, result shows us is, is that you get opposing outcomes uh, depending on which phase of theta you hit. And the other very dominant mechanism that has been proposed is uh, spike timing dependent plasticity or uh, STDP. And what that mechanism uh, uh, suggests is, is or, or dictates is, is happening is that whether long-term depression or long-term potentiation is observed depends uh, on the sequence of firing between a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron, such that if the presynaptic neuron fires before the postsynaptic neuron, then long-term potentiation happens, and this uh, the strength of this potentiation decays exponentially with the time delay of firing between the pre and post synaptic neuron. And if the sequence is reversed, such that the post synaptic neuron fires before the presynaptic neuron, then long term depression is observed. And also, this decays exponentially with the temporal distance uh, of the two uh, firing events. And oscillations have been suggested to play a very uh, uh, strong role in modulating. Uh, STDP because of their ability to synchronize different neural populations. So um, we set out to investigate um, these plasticity mechanisms in, in the human brain uh, non-invasively. So how can you possibly do this? Um, and here's what we came up with. So in the first uh, experiment, and that was designed by Andrew Clouter, who is now a lecturer at Nottingham Trent University. Uh, we tested um, whether phase dependent plasticity mechanisms, whether they do exist in the human brain. And um, I would like you to imagine that you're a participant in this experiment and I'm going to play this video. And I've tested this before. <laughs> And it worked, so I hope it works now also. 
So <clears throat> what you will be seeing now is some short movies that are accompanied by some sound and the videos should be flickering. You might not be able to fully appreciate the frequency of flickering, but you will hopefully see that something is happening with the video and the sound is also rhythmically modulated. And your job as a participant is to associate the, the, the sound with the video. So here we go. So hopefully now you have seen four videos which were uh, accompanied by some sound, the sound rhythmically modulated at, at four hertz and the video also flickering at four hertz, although it might not have been looking like four hertz on, on, on depending on your screen settings. And then there is a brief distractor, the subject is asked to count backwards from, from a random number. And afterwards, we will be playing the sound and your job as a participant is to recall which of the videos uh, went with the sound. So here it would be video number three. And here would be video number two. Okay, so that was the task in a nutshell. Um, and what were we hoping to achieve with this task? Well, what we were hoping to achieve with this is that we can synchronize the visual and the auditory uh, uh, regions such that their effect on a downstream uh, region, such as the hippocampus, where ultimately the two uh, streams will be merged together to form an associative memory, would arrive either asynchronously, such that they're, they're completely out of phase, so they never would hit on the same theta phase in the hippocampus, or synchronously, such that they would hit at the same theta phase in the hippocampus. And of course, synchronous presentation should lead to a good memory outcome, and um, asynchronous presentation should lead to a bad memory outcome. And uh, we had four different conditions, the synchronous condition where the video and the sound were presented such that the auditory and visual regions in the brain would be synchronized. And uh, then we had 90 degrees out of phase condition, 180 degrees out of phase condition and 270 degrees out of phase condition. So we stepwise shifted the sound uh, such that the signal would be gradually desynchronized. And together we term these three conditions the asynchronous condition. And what we observed in the behavioral data was indeed a memory dependent, uh, 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 so uh, effect on memory depending on the degree of synchronization such that when both the video and the sound were synchronized, memory was best. And when they were desynchronized, memory was not as good. And uh, when I first saw this result, it was, of course, first it was happy because we did see an effect, but then I was puzzled because I was expecting the 90 and the 270 degree to be just slightly better than the 180 degree condition because here we're not completely out of phase. And I was expecting to see some sinusoidal-like modulation, but this is not at all what we saw here. And that uh, will become uh, important as we go on through the talk. So I would like you to keep that in mind. Um, then we asked the question whether this effect is specific for theta or whether we uh, observe this effect also at other frequencies. And um, here what I show is the synchronous conditions of the zero degree condition and the 90, 180 and 270 uh, average together uh, which we term the asynchronous condition. And we saw, of course, uh, synchronous, an advantage for memory for the synchronous compared to the asynchronous condition in theta, that's again replicated here in that second experiment. But we did not see this effect for a slower frequency like delta or for a faster frequency like uh, alpha. So to this end, this effect seemed to be frequency specific and only occurring at the theta frequency at about four Hertz for humans. Now, um, we um, aim to replicate these effects now with an EEG study where we recorded the EEG concurrently and um, we could then 
based on the signals in the auditory cortex and visual cortex that we source localized from the EEG, we could backsort the trials based on whether the uh, two regions were in sync, so zero degree uh, uh, synchronized or 90, 180 or 270. And uh, look at the behavior uh, depending on these conditions. And again, we replicated this pattern that zero was best and 90, 180 and 270 were, were worse. And again, we observed this, this absence of a sinusoidal shape um, but instead we saw that 90 and 270 were equally bad as, as one, 180 degrees condition. So the question very much is what, what, what is going on here and which plasticity mechanisms uh, could possibly explain uh, this pattern? Now we had of course uh, many more experiments planned to, to, to get to the bottom of this, but then the pandemic struck and we all uh, were stuck at home. So what did we do? We uh, did some modeling, of course. Um, and that project was led by, by Dan Ying and, and, and George Parrish. Um, and what we con uh, constructed was a very simple model indeed, which uh, comprised of a bunch of uh, neocortical neurons that would reflect the visual cortex and the auditory cortex. And then these would project to their downstream partners in the hippocampus and learning would occur at the hippocampal level where the two groups of neurons can influence each other and uh, uh, um, exhibit uh, uh, synaptic uh, plasticity. <clears throat> And the learning rule that we were used was basically a mix of theta phase dependent learning and spike timing dependent plasticity. So we, um, we, we were interested whether both together, if we mix them both together, whether those could explain our behavioral pattern. And how we mix them together was, was uh, is shown here. So we have uh, the theta peak, we favored, um, long-term depression, such that if two neurons would fire in such a way that long-term depression would uh, 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 be exhibited or would, be, would follow from STDP, then we uh, um, weighted that with one. And if LTP would follow, then we weighted that with, with zero. And we did the opposite for the theta trough. So for the theta trough, we uh, um, weighted uh, long-term potentiation with one and long-term depression with zero. And at the zero crossings, we let both happen with half the weights. So essentially you have the STDP, which dictates whether long-term depression or long-term potentiation is happening and to which degree that's happening. And then on top of that, you modulate that with a theta oscillation, which then ultimately um, um, zeroes out or, or, or amplifies uh, either long-term depression or long-term potentiation, depending on when these events occur with respect to the theta phase. And into this um, simple model, then we fed our input stimulus. So we have the visual uh, uh, sine wave modulated input and the auditory sine wave modulated input. And we looked at, uh, at the weights, synaptic weight change. Uh, as a proxy for learning. So here we see what the model is doing. So at zero, our stimulus starts, our videos start, or our wacky little uh, um, uh, sound video modulated um, stimuli start, and they're presented for three seconds. And you can see that for zero phase degree condition, indeed the, synapse, the synaptic weights go up, rhythmically reflecting the four hertz input. And they arrive at the rather high point after these three seconds. Whereas for 90, 180 and 270, they pretty much stay at the bottom. And this pattern nicely replicates the behavioral patterns from these two experiments. So you can see the data from Claudia et al and Wang et al uh, in black here. And in blue, you can see our simulated uh, they uh, are simulated hippocampal weights and they nicely track this decrease of memory performance as we increase the, the synchronicity, or oh, sorry, as we increase the, the desynchronicity or as we desynchronize the two signals, 90, 180 and 270. And our model also nicely replicates the frequency specificity of this effect. So here again, the effects from Claudia et al. 
to find the difference between synchronous and asynchronous condition for theta, but not for delta and alpha. And uh, our model uh, produces the same uh, uh, type of, of, of pattern. There is a slight advantage in delta here, um, but no advantage here for alpha for synchronous compared to asynchronous. And there is a huge advantage for synchronous compared to asynchronous for theta. So we think that together this model uh, nicely replicated our uh, effects that we found. In, in behavior, um, but we did a little bit of model uh, validation here um, to see whether the model would produce the similar results. Um, also, if we kick out the spike time independent plasticity or the theta phase dependent plasticity mechanism. So in other words, we were interested in whether the model can produce the same pattern uh, uh, without the theta phase mechanism or without the SCDP mechanism. And so here's the result for when we um, only allow theta phase dependent learning. So here we've kicked out the spike time dependent plasticity model and the blue shows the, again the, the performance of the model with both STDP and theta phase plasticity happening. And in orange, we see the, what the model does if, if we kick out spike time independent plasticity. And as you would expect, the model produces this sinusoidal pattern where 90 and 270 degree is slightly better than 180 degree. Um, and therefore it is uh, a worse fit than uh, the full model. So this shows that we need STDP in order to reproduce our behavioral findings. And here we did the opposite. So here we, we looked at what the model uh, would, would predict if we kick out theta phase uh, dependent learning. And there you see again that the model does a worse fit compared to the full model, because here now we get the very high uh, learning performance for the 90 degree phase condition. And of course, um, that, that, that happens because for the 90 degree phase condition, you have the, the, the auditory neurons uh, or more the visual neurons slightly um, 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 spiking uh, in a short time window after the auditory neuron spikes. So you get a very strong LTP for, for 90 degree condition. And then that decays exponentially. So there's nothing happening for 180 and 270. So um, finally, uh, we were also interested to see whether we can uh, also replicate the initial findings by Huerta and Lisman uh, that they found in the slice, uh, uh, in slice preparations in rodents. And uh, to cut the long story short, we, we, we nicely replicate the findings because of different uh, naming conventions. Um, we, we, we basically swapped the peak with the trough here. I do apologize for this confusion, but um, it is um, uh, consistent with 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 uh, Huert and Lisman, such that we get um, a different outcome depending on whether we stimulate in the peak or in the trough. Um, meaning that we get LTD here at the peak uh, and uh, LTP uh, at the trough, and also the number of bursts very much. Uh, um, modulates the degree to which long-term potentiation, long-term depression is happening. So to conclude um, this part of the talk, we can say that uh, multi-sensory episodic memories uh, depend on, on theta phase synchronization of the input streams. If they're synchronized, then we get better memory performance than when they're desynchronized. And these behavioral patterns that we observe they um, are best explained by a combination of theta phase dependent plasticity and spike time independent plasticity. So these two mechanisms, um, if, if we mix them together um, and, and allow them to interact, they both together can indeed explain the pattern that we observe uh, in behavior. And in general, I think this, this mix of using these uh, rather simple, if you like, uh, entrainment paradigms um, and collect behavioral data and then add computational modeling uh, to that in order to understand 
uh, how these patterns come about, I think that's a really promising tool because it allows us to, to link memory effects in humans with these well-documented plasticity mechanisms that are that have been identified in the animal models. So I very much uh, uh, came to, to, to like this approach because it really, I think, helps us to narrow down the, the possible mechanisms that are at play here. So what next? This uh, is, of course, uh, this symposium or this workshop is a lot of it is dedicated to TACS. So <laughs> the obvious question is, can we achieve the same result with TACS? And another question you might have is, what about gamma? Um, because gamma oscillations, especially in the hippocampus, have also been very, very strongly linked to uh, memory formation. And I tried to give an answer to a preliminary answer to both. So uh, Mircea van der Plas in my lab has done uh, an, uh, I would say Herculean effort to replicate these results with TACS. Um, and I say Herculean effort because Mircea tested 120 subjects in two sessions each. Um, and what we did in this experiment is we presented the sounds modulated just as before. So the sound was a four hertz modulated uh, um, sound, um, rhythmic input, but the video was presented unmodulated. So this time the video was not flickering, it was uh, presented as normal, but we modulated visual uh, activity or hoped to be modulating visual activity uh, with TACS using these, these uh, such an electrode setup that we target the visual cortex and where the control montage where we would target uh, the, the, the motor cortex. And using this setup, we then could, uh, were able to put the video and the sound in or out of phase at, in the same way we were hoping as we did in the um, previous uh, sensory rhythmic uh, studies. Now, to cut the long story short, um, this did not produce any positive results. Indeed, the, 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 the Bayesian statistics we've conducted uh, suggested that there was very strong evidence for the null results. So there was no difference between the different phase uh, conditions, as you can see here, in these uh, very uh, strongly overlapping um, distributions here. Now, what about gamma? Um, so we also are investigating the role of gamma here using a similar setup. And here I wanna show some data from uh, uh, Chloe, um, my lab PhD student, where she presented videos to the left and to the right on the screen. So here we don't have any sounds, we have videos. This participant fixates here on the fixation cross and to see a video to the left and to the right. And uh, what this does is of course, is in, 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 it induces a very strong uh, flickering response at 37.5 uh, Hertz, which is the frequency that we modulated these videos with. So roughly the, the slow gamma frequency, if you will. And uh, this allowed us to put the two videos in phase or gradually shift them out of phase, such that they would be either synchronized at, at zero degrees or gradually uh, desynchronized at 90, 180, and 270. Um, as we verified here with the EEG recordings. Keep in mind, this is a very fast frequency, 35.7 Hertz. So the difference between zero and 90 degrees about uh, between six and seven milliseconds. Um, so the EEG results suggested that we achieved what we wanted to achieve. We can put the two stimuli streams in and out of phase. However, that had no bearing on uh, memory uh, performance. There was a slight trend for zero to be better than one, than 90, 180, and 270, but this was far from being significant. I think a power analysis indicated that we would have needed 290 subjects or so to get this effect significant. So the effect is, if anything, small of gamma memory performance. Okay, so um, that's it uh, so far. Um, uh, yeah, so I would like to thank you for your attention. 
uh, and I would like in particular to thank the, the, the students and postdocs that were involved in these studies, Dan Ying Wang, uh, um, George Parrish, uh, um, Xiao Yu, Shen, uh, Chloe, um, Andrew Clouter, who is now at Nottingham Trent University, and um, Kim Shapiro, uh, who was uh, collaborating on, on most of these projects. Thank you, Simon. Sensory modulation has a unique advantage that it's so such a different modality that you can record EEG or do any kind of neuroimaging. So in this case, it's cool. Um, or you can combine it with you know electrical magnetic and and you try to. So I have a little question about this, uh, like whether you explore further attempt to combine acoustic, visual, and electric or magnetic stimulation. And what do you think happened with uh, the attempt that you demonstrate? So is sensory stimulation so stronger that pretty much TECS does nothing or they cancel out each other? Or what's your interpretation of, of this data that you just showed? So you, you're referring to the null results where we didn't, weren't able yeah. to, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I don't know what, <laughs> what went wrong <laughs> with that experiment. Um, um, I mean, I, I think, uh, of course, um, rhythmic sensory stimulation is very effective, right? So we know exactly, well, we know pretty well what it does to the neurons uh, and the mm -hmm. neurons that respond to the stimulation, they will start firing rhythmically and to some extent they will uh, uh, convey that rhythm on downstream neurons. So we are on, on, on safe grounds here, whereas with TACS, um, things are much more complex, the effects are much weaker. And then um, I think in Matt Krause's talk today, we, we were all humbled by just how complex the effects can be uh, of TSCS on the single neurons. So I think there is just way, way more variance uh, mm -hmm. there. Um, and that, you know, w when I see things like, you know, you stimulate with, with a frequency um, of, of say five hertz, like Matt, Matt has shown and some neurons increase and then train and other neurons decrease and fall out of phase with that rhythm, then of course, everything is possible in terms of, of, of behavior. So then it's no surprise to me that, that this did not work, even if, you know, we did uh, entrain some of these neurons, right? So, yeah. Yeah, there, there's, there's always a missing link between entraining a neuron and complex behavior, right? It's like <laughs> quite a distance. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, indeed. Yeah, uh, there are two questions from the audience about the same study, I will combine them. Uh, what was the intensity of the ECS and whether you apply it at individual theta frequency or what's your um, insight in the frequency of the ECS? So we did uh, not apply that individual uh, theta frequency. We applied it fixed at four hertz. And the reason for that was, was because our auditory stimulus was also modulated at four hertz. So, um, and in, in those previous experiments where we present the multisensory, both the video and the audio are modulated with four hertz. So to mm -hmm. that sense, we wanted to, to stick uh, to that uh, particular frequency. Mm -hmm. And the intensity was, um, I hope I'm getting the details right, two milliamps uh, peak to peak. Mm -hmm. um, but Mircha, please write something in the chat if I'm getting this wrong. But I think it was two milliamps. Peak to baseline, he just wrote in chat. Peak to, oh, peak to baseline, so even more. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because we 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 actually did use the 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 Emla cream, so we could stimulate with slightly higher intensities there. Yeah. Okay, so I think two milliamp peak to baseline is pretty much as far as you can uh, reasonably go. Yeah. Okay. Another question: uh, Do you think you would get a null effect if you stimulated visual cortex in alpha? Do you think memory encoding is, is in theta is simply a subharmonic of visual alpha? 
Um, so yes, I think we would get a null effect. I mean, in those previous, so, so, so the ground truth for me is the multisensory stimulation experiments, right? Uh, and there we tried different frequencies and only theta produced the result and alpha. Um, I think the frequency we used was precisely was 9.8 Hertz because we used the golden mean rule um, in order to avoid harmonics and subharmonics. So um, to that end, the theta that we stimulate here with is not a subharmonic of alpha first. And second, um, we did target alpha in the multicentric stimulation experiment and that did not produce an effect. So yes, I would not expect an effect if we stimulate the, the whole thing in alpha.